So we're going to be talking about unconditional election and there is here another uh, misunderstanding that many have about being born again. They see that being justified or saved as synonymous as being of the same thing but in reality they are two different terms which depict two related but nonetheless distinct events. Now being born again enables us to have faith in Christ, something that we can never do while still dead in our trespasses and sins. Being born again is the first act of God's grace. It makes us new creatures in Christ. And as new creatures, we're no longer haters of God. We're no longer at enmity with God. So in the words of uh, the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36, verse 26, God removes our hearts of stone and replaces them with hearts of flesh. And with the scales now removed from our eyes, we can see the holiness of God and, most especially, the sinfulness of ourselves. So as a result, we repent and have faith in God and what he has done for us and for us through the cross. So being born again must of necessity precede faith. So the question remains is how is a sinner born again so that he may have faith in Christ? Because of what God has done before the foundations of the world, he has counterintuitive an innumerable amount of people that will respond to the gospel. They will be his followers. They will become his disciples of uh, the Lord Jesus. And he guarantees it. Now, many if not most modern Christians tend to either ignore or lightly skim over words like chosen, predestination, and election. So when they see them in the Bible, uh, they basically glance over them and assume what it means. The reason for this is simple. The biblical doctrine of election is, humanly speaking, an offense to the natural human tendency to believe that we play a part in our own salvation. But the Bible declares this truth often without apology. We need to come to terms with it, whether we like it or not. And here are some examples. For many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew chapter 22, verse 14. And then he will send his angels and gather together his elect from the four winds, from the furthest part of the earth to the furthest part of the heavens. Mark chapter 13 verse 27. And shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them. Luke chapter 18 verse 7. You did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. John chapter 15 verse 16. And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. Acts chapter 13 verse 48. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it. And the rest were blinded, Romans chapter 11, verse 7. Just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world, that we should be holy without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ, to himself according to his good pleasure of his will, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4 to 5. The New Testament letters were specifically addressed to the elect. Also consider that the word must often, uh, most often translated church in the New Testament is the Greek word ecclesia, meaning the called uh, out ones. The term comes from the Greek root eklestos, uh, the word we translate as the elect. So the terms church and elect ones are roughly synonymous. The word beloved is another word that refers to the elect, though the passages in which it appears are too numerous to mention. Let's uh, look at just one passage. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 13. Another term 
God uses to refer to his elect children is sheep. In John chapter 10 verse 26, Jesus declares to the unbelieving Jews, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. Note that Jesus did not say because you did not believe, you are not my sheep. Instead, he declares that the opposite. They did not believe because they were not members of his flock. The word because assigns the reason for their unbelief. They simply were not his sheep, nor elect. His sheep will believe. So obviously, I can imagine that some are asking the question, well, how could a loving God they choose to give some mercy and grace and withhold it from others? Well, I don't see people having a problem uh, when God called out Israel and set them apart and set his love upon them and distinguish them as his people. We don't have a problem with that. Why all of a sudden when we go into the New Testament, get the notion that this New Testament, God cannot set his covenantal love upon a person uh, as distinct from the others. We read it with a humanistic judgment of what fairness and love is. But God explicitly says in scripture several times, I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. Exodus chapter 33 verse 19. So the question is to those bold to impose standards upon God, where do you stand to get your standard by which you measure God? He himself is the standard and he does what he does and he only he can do what he pleases him. So the truth is God is God and he can do whatever he wants. According to the Armenian party, the formulation is that God looked down through the corridors of time and foresaw those who would choose him and then ratify their choice by electing them. Therefore, election to the Armenian was conditional based upon man's proper reaction. So the, according to the Council of Dort, uh, this was a pure Pelagianism. In their official denunciation of the remonstrance, they wrote, for this does away with all effective functioning of God's grace in our conversion and subjects the activity of Almighty God to the will of man. It is contrary to the apostles who teach that we believe by the virtue of the effective working of God's mighty strength, as in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 19. And God fulfills undeserved goodwill of his kindness and the work of faith in us with power, as in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 11. And likewise, that his divine power has given us everything we need for life and godliness, as in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. We must believe that our salvation is by grace, that even the faith we have comes from a gift from God. And this is nothing that we can do or lay claim to. This has nothing to do with us. Otherwise, we will boast. And our salvation comes entirely from the Lord. So people are either elect or non-elect. Before they are born, there is nothing a person can do to get himself elected. It is not like God had voted for you and the devil has voted against you and now you make your election sure by voting one way or the other. But some would use Romans chapter 8 verse 29. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among the brethren. The word foreknew was understood by the Armenians to mean that God knew and saw beforehand which sinners would believe and that he then predestined them to salvation based upon this knowledge. Notice, however, that the text does not say that God knew something about particular individuals, that they would do this or do that, or that he saw their actions. Even though both statements are true, rather it states that God knew the individuals themselves, that the word whom is the object of the verb 
and the object denotes person, not events or happenings. The Bible says, whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed into the image of his son. The word foreknew does not mean foresee, it means for love. Take for example, in Genesis chapter 4 verse 1, we are told Adam knew his wife and she conceived. Now, if all he did was intellectually foresee Eve, she would have uh, never conceived. The point is, he made her the object of his love, affection, and she conceived. And so in Romans chapter 8, it states that whom he foreloved, those whom he foreknew, those he predestined, whom he set his love upon, those whom he chose according to the, his good pleasure and will. He determined that in time they would believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So addressing the elect nation of Israel, God declares, you only have I known of all the families of the earth, Amos chapter 3 verse 2. So surely the Lord had, a, had knowledge of and can see all the actions of every family of the earth, but he knew or loved Israel in a special way and set his heart upon them alone. The Armenian attempt is to redefine the doctrine of election. Now, in contradiction from the doctrine of conditional election, the confessors of the Dutch church taught what is called unconstitutional election. They believe that God elected certain individuals in Christ before the foundations of the world based upon Christ's sacrifice. His reason for selecting the ones he did was solely based upon his own goodwill and pleasure. He loved them even though they were just as deserving of his wrath as those who did not love. And those whom he elected to love through the power and regeneration work of the Holy Spirit, he caused them to be born again, whereby they willingly accepted Christ. So what is the basis for God electing one and not another? Uh, this is a fascinating question and I want to tell you that the Bible never answers it. It answers it in the negative. It tells you what things are not the basis for elections. For example, the Apostle Paul states that in considering our calling, remember that not many mighty are called, not many noble, not many of the great people of this world are called to salvation. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26 to 31. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac, for the children not yet being born, not having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the older shall serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. Romans chapter 9 verse 9 to 13. So the reason for choosing one over the other is that the purpose of God according to election might stand. Election is other words is of God, by God, through God. So nowhere does man have any room to boast. Paul concludes the passage by echoing the verse from Malachi chapter 1 verse uh, 2 to 3. And in his mouth it comes one of the most controversial statements in the entire Bible. Jacob I have loved, but Esau I have hated. So Charles Spurgeon states that why did God love Jacob and hate Esau? I can tell you why. God loves Jacob. It is sovereign grace. There was nothing in Jacob that could make God love him. There was everything about him that might have made God hate him as much as he did Esau, and a great deal more. But it was because God is infinitely gracious. He loved Jacob. And because he is sovereign, 
in his dispensation of his grace and his love, he chose Jacob as the object of that love. Now the Armenian remonstrance attempted to soften the blow of this passage by saying that God loved Jacob more than Esau and therefore it was really not hate. They argue that the word translated hate means unloved or less loved, as if at the end this really makes any difference. Why did God hate Esau? Why does God hate anyone, any, any man for that matter? You see, God owes salvation to no one. God would be entirely just if he would have condemned Adam and the entire human race immediately after the fall. God would be just to send every single person to hell because that is what our sin deserves. The eternal wrath and curse of God is upon man, sinful man. At the Senate of Dodd explained it this way, God does not owe this grace to anyone. For what could God owe to one who has nothing to give back and can give or pay back? Instead, what could God owe to one who has nothing of his own to give but sin and falsehood? Beggars don't have any claims upon man's money. In the same way, we do not have any claims upon God's goodness and God's favor. And the fact that God saves anybody declares him to be very gracious and loving. Election puts nobody in hell and a vast multitude in heaven that wouldn't be there otherwise. In heaven, we would have nothing to boast about in ourselves. In hell, we would have no one to blame but ourselves. So both the Holy Spirit and Paul knew that this teaching was going to be controversial and purposefully set out to address the very natural uh, human objection from its outset. So what shall we say then, notes Paul, is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not in Romans chapter 9 verse 14. See the Armenian view attempts to make the doctrine of election seem unfair and unjust to the mind, uh, to natural mind of man. But Apostle Paul takes the opposite view. Rather than making it more fair, he continues to emphasize the absolute sovereignty of God by giving us another Old Testament example. For he says to Moses, uh, I will have mercy upon whomever I will have mercy and I will have compassion upon whoever I will have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy upon whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. Romans chapter 8 verses 15 to 18. So is Paul saying that God actually hardens people's hearts? That he makes them stonier than they already are? Six times in the Exodus account we are told the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. But it is important to understand how God accomplished this. He didn't just arbitrarily uh, harden Pharaoh's heart against his will. Three times the Bible declares that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. What happened is that God sovereignly created the situation where Pharaoh was confronted with a decision as to whether to obey God or instead lean on his own will and understanding. Given his sinful nature and the fact that God did not grant him the grace to overcome that nature, Pharaoh chose sin of his own accord and will. So as sin always does, it brought forth spiritual decay and death. And so Pharaoh's heart became harder. With each successive act of rebellion, God brought forth the test. But it was Pharaoh that failed them. This same principle of withholding the gift of grace was reflected in Jesus' ministry, which is many centuries later. 
when asked by his disciples why he spoke in, uh, to the people in parables, the Lord replied, because it has been given to you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. Matthew chapter 13, verse 11. In other words, as with Pharaoh, there are people that God has chosen not to help believe. And when confronted with the truth, it is these people who of their own accord will choose to harden their hearts and instead persecute the truth. So in fact, in the, their case, they sought to destroy the truth by nailing it to the cross. So Jesus in Matthew chapter 11, when he was contemplating the fact that many of the people in Caesarea were where he did most of his public ministry, did not believe or receive the gospel, he thanked God and he, that he had hidden the gospel from the wise and the prudent, and he had revealed it unto babes. And then he went on to express the reason for that thanksgiving, because it was good in his father's sight. So it was the father's choice that he would receive and believe the gospel and who would remain hard-hearted. So you say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? Romans chapter 9 verse 19. Paul's answer is a stiff rebuke to any man who would dare to sit in judgment of God. But indeed, O oh man, who are you to reply against God? Will the thing formed say to him who formed it, why have you made me like this? Romans chapter 9 verse 20. Paul insists that as sinners, we have no rights before God. We have no claims on his mercy. God could have elected everybody. He could have elected none. The choice, therefore, was his and his alone. So then we come to the next question. Does not the potter have power over the clay from the same lump to make one vessel for honor and another for dishonor? What if God wanted to show his wrath and, he, and, and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessel of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he had called not of the jews but also of the gentiles romans chapter 9 verse 21 to 24 this is in the ninth chapter of Romans, as well as numerous other passages, led the Senate of Dort to reject the Armenian doctrine of conditional election. They labeled it as heresy, likened it to Pelagianism, and called it an error by which the Dutch churches have for some time now disturbed. So, election does not save anyone. It simply marked those in Christ whom God of his own free will chose to be the object of his affection and mercy.